Well, good morning, everybody, and we want to uh, we want to wish all of the moms out there a happy Mother's Day, and we uh, we just want to celebrate you. We wish we could have been gathering together to celebrate you a little bit more formally, but listen, we bless you, we honor you, thank you. Uh, thank you for being great moms, and we hope that today is a very, very special day for you. And so we want to welcome all of you that have tuned in. Uh, we want to make sure that you you uh, share this, uh, this victory moment. Make sure that you share this, wh- whatever platform you're watching from. If you're able to share this link, go ahead and share it. We want to be a blessing to so many more people, and if, uh, if you can start a watch party, go ahead and do that. Have others join you. I've got a watch party going on on my phone right here, and so we want to make sure that you do that as well, and uh, we just want to welcome everyone uh, this morning, and we're excited because we're continuing our victory series called Jesus Wins, Jesus Wins, and so we've been learning uh, through this series. We learned the first week. We learned how, how that uh, a blind beggar by the name of Bartimaeus, we saw how Jesus won in his life and how he can win in our lives. We also learned a couple weeks ago how Jesus wins even behind closed doors, how he wins behind closed doors. And, and then last week we learned that Jesus wins, so let's cheer. And we learned that there were three cheers that Jesus gave us in the Bible, that because Jesus wins, you and I can cheer up because we can cheer up because he's overcome the world, our sins are forgiven, and he's in our midst. And so today I want to talk about uh, Jesus wins, how about me? Jesus wins, how about me? And so I want to unpack this a little bit because I think often what happens is, I don't know about you, but whenever you see somebody doing something well, You think to yourself, man, they make that look easy. And then you try it, and it's just not as easy as it looks. So my youngest daughter, uh, I've got three girls, and and so we're celebrating, uh, uh, you know, today. But but we've got three girls, and uh, my youngest daughter, she just turned 13 uh, yesterday, and she's got a skateboard, and then she's got this other thing She's got this other thing called a rip stick. Now, the skateboard is one thing. A skateboard is four wheels and a, and a long, flat board. A rip stick is something completely different. It's two skinny wheels on each end and a very thin board. Now, when I see her ride that, I think to myself, she makes that look easy. I want to give it a try. And then I remember how old I am and how it's no longer as easy for me at my age to bounce back up when I smack the floor. Now, I've tried it, but um, I just realized that it's a lot harder than what it looks. And I think a lot of times when it comes to, when we hear messages that are encouraging like this, we, we get so full of faith and we get so encouraged, and then we go on with our week, and it, and it feels that way. It feels like, man, this is, this is a lot harder than what the way we make, make it sound. And so I want to give us, I wanna give us some, some thoughts, some tips, very practical, very simple thoughts for us to consider today as we talk about Jesus wins. How, how about me? How do, I, how do I appropriate? How do I apply the victory of Jesus in my life? Or at least how can I begin making steps to, uh, to experiencing those Jesus wins, those Jesus victories in my life. And so that's what today, today's message is about. I want to go ahead and ask you to turn to one place in your Bible this morning. If you've got a paper Bible, go ahead and turn to Psalms chapter 42. Uh, just one place today, Psalms 42. We're going to begin there in just a moment. Um, if you're using a smart device, then go ahead and click on Psalms 42. Now, a little bit of background with Psalms 42. Psalms 42 um, is is written about how when, whenever David, King David, whenever uh, Absalom, one of David's sons, uh, started a coup against David, was wanting to dethrone him, and so, and so David would flee Jerusalem, and he would basically go into a self-quarantine. He would shut himself in and be in a, in a place where he was hiding out because of this coup and what was happening. In fact, he wanted to um, he wanted to go out and he wanted to be a, he wanted to be a part of what was happening and, and to really talk to Absalom and, and, and try to calm things down. But his advisor said, no, listen, David, if we go out, even with a great army, 
they're going to be coming after you. And so we need to keep you isolated. We need, to, we need to keep you alone off here by yourself. And so Psalm 42 is kind of written out of that, that self-imposed isolation, that place of where David was, where he was de- depressed and maybe even afraid and, and, and just in that moment of, of fear and panic and isolation. And so let's begin reading in verse 1, Psalms 42, 1. David says this, As the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you. And, and that's been turned into a, a very popular song. But then he goes on to say, My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Now, he, here's something that we have a connection with in this verse. Because basically what David is saying when he says, When shall I come and appear before God? He's, he's asking this question. When can I get back to church? When, when am I able to leave my, my dwelling place to be able to, in his, in his world, to go back to Jerusalem, to the tabernacle, to the temple, and meet with God? It's what many of us are asking. When are we going to be able to get back to church and meet with God and appear before God and worship? I miss that moment of worship where I'm connecting with God, and that's what David is saying. And, and he's in this chapter, what I, what, what's interesting about this chapter, what I love about it is that I, I can relate to it, you can relate to it, because listen, David's emotions are all over the place. And, and those are the things that we want to look at and learn from, and, and, uh, and so look at verse 4. Verse 4, David is saying, when I remember these things, when I remember these things, when I remember the, the time and the season when things were normal... <laughs> When I was able to, to go and appear before God, I was able to go to church whenever I wanted to and, and, and things were just normal and, and everything was going well and things were going good. When I remember these things, he says, I pour out my soul within me for I used to go with the multitude. They're, they're, that's what he's saying. I, I used to be able to go into large gatherings. I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise, with a multitude that kept a pilgrim feast. He said, man, I remember the days when I used to be able to gather in large crowds. I remember what used to be. I remember the joy of what life was like. And, 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 and there he was just kind of saying, I'm pouring out my soul within me. And I'm having all of these internal conversations with myself. And so uh, here's the first thought I want to give to you that I believe will help us, uh, will help us appropriate, will help us uh, grab a hold of the Jesus victories and the Jesus wins that we know he's already won, but how about me? Here, here's the first, first thought and very practical that I want to I wanna share with you, and it's this. Stop talking to yourself. Stop talking to yourself. Because the problem is you'll discourage yourself and others around you. When you get into a season like this, and there's negativity around you, and there's discouragement around you, and you're feeling that sense of, of just being pressed down, and, and you're depressed, or you're fearful, or you're uncertain about the future, what's happening in life right now, because the truth is, as we're walking through this, there are a lot more fears and a lot more unknowns that many of us are uncertain of. What started off as a fear of getting sick is now a fear of a job situation or the economy or what things are going to be like once, once we start getting out and, and doing things again. And there's a lot of unknowns. And when you're depressed, listen, here's what I'm telling you. When you're depressed, when you're down, when you're emotionally just zapped, uh, zapped of strength and anything positive in your life, don't listen to yourself. Stop talking to yourself. Because here's the problem, when you go down the negative road, here's what always happens. The enemy jumps in, and you know what? He makes it worse. The enemy jumps in, and he makes it worse. In fact, if you continue to read in verse 3 of Psalms 42, David says, My tears have been my food day and night. I can't stop crying. I can't stop worrying. While they continue to say to me, where is your God? So that's, that's the voice that David is hearing. He, he's, he's depressed, he's down, he's isolated. Things aren't normal anymore. He's worried about the future. He's worried about the unknown. 
And then he's going down this, this pity party, this depressed party. And then all of a sudden, the enemy jumps in because he says, they say, where is your God? And can I tell you, there is always that voice out there, and it's the voice of the enemy, that whenever you're going through a trying moment, a tough time, a moment of unknown, a season that brings depression, that zaps you of strength, there's always that voice that would say to you, where is your God? Yeah, Jesus wins, but where is he in your life? Where is he in your home? Where is he in your family, in your situation, in your economic situation, in your job, in your space, in your world? Where is he? You see him there for others. You hear stories, but where is your God? He goes on to say in verse 9 and 10 of the same chapter, Psalms 42, why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? See, there it is. He recognizes that there's an enemy. As with a breaking of my bones, he says, I feel like I'm just being crushed. My enemies reproach me while they say to me all day long, where is your God? So it wasn't just David talking to himself. It's like the enemy joined him and began talking even more things to him that brought him down even more. Listen, I want you to know this and hear this very clearly. Clearly, we have an enemy too. Satan loves to jump in your life at your lowest moments and to tell you where is your God. But listen to me, listen to me very carefully. If Satan's lips are moving, he's lying. Satan is a liar. In fact, Jesus called him one. Jesus would go on to say that not only is he a liar, but he's a father of lies. Nothing that Satan tells you is the truth. Nothing. He's a liar. And I thought about how in 1 Kings, I thought about another man who experienced something very similar in his life. And, and what I love about the Bible is when, when we see these, these characters in the Bible, um, they're, they're people. They're human. They have humanness. They're, they're not, they don't walk around with these halos as if they always got it all right. David, for sure, is a prime example. But I thought of how in 1 Kings chapter 19, there was another man by the name of Elijah. In 1 Kings chapter 19, Elijah, the prophet, after his greatest victory, became depressed became depressed because in verse 2 in verse 2 there was a woman a wicked woman by the name of Jezebel and what he said to what she said to Elijah was by this time tomorrow in 24 hours you Elijah are going to be dead i'm going to take you out in 24 hours Elijah will be no more and that came after his greatest victory after he had experienced a mountaintop experience in life he gets this message from this wicked woman called Jezebel and the Bible says that he went and isolated himself and hid in a cave and there is Elijah he's depressed and he's fearful of the future, and he's fearful of the words of the enemy, and he's in a cave, he's isolated, he's quarantined, he's inside of this cave all by himself, and he even says he is. He think, looks at life, and he doesn't see purpose anymore, and because of fear of the unknown, and because of not knowing the future, and because of the words that he was listening to, he's in a cave, and the Bible says that he began looking for God in that cave. And then an earthquake happened, and there was no God. And then a mighty wind occurred, and there was no God. And then a storm came, and there was no God. Have you ever gone through an earthquake experience in life? Have you ever had the winds of life blow on you so much that it has taking you off course and knock you down? Have you ever had an unexpected storm come into your world and just wreck your world? And like Elijah, you're saying, where is God? God wasn't in the earthquake. He wasn't in the wind. He wasn't in the storm. But you know what the Bible says in 1 Kings 19? Is that a still, still small voice occurred. And that, in that still small voice, in stillness and in quietness and in silence, Elijah found God. Or should I say, God found Elijah. 
It was in that still, stillness of that moment where Elijah said, man, God, you weren't in the earthquake, in the wind, or in the storm, but in the stillness, when I quieted my, when I stopped talking to myself, when I stopped rehearsing the words of that wicked woman, the words of the enemy, when I stopped hitting replay over and over and over again in my heart and in my soul and in my mind of what could be being afraid of the future I was able in stillness and quietness tune into your voice and hear your voice in my heart and so and so here's the encourage here's here's basically a recap of this story Elijah was told by Jezebel you've got 24 hours to live by this time tomorrow you're gonna die well guess what 24 hours came and went Elijah was still alive in fact 48 hours came and went Elijah was still alive a week passed by, Elijah was still alive. A month passed by, hey, Elijah's still kicking. A year later, Elijah was alive. And if you read 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11, because there is another chapter, there is another book that God is going to write in your life. When you read 2 Kings 2, 11, the Bible says that Elijah, that he was caught up in a chariot into heaven. What does that mean? That means that 2,800 years later, guess what? Elijah is still still alive today. Why? Because what heaven started, hell cannot stop it. What heaven started, hell cannot stop it. So stop talking to yourself. And then here's number two. Write this down. Start talking to yourself. <laughs> Start talking to yourself. In other words, stop talking to yourself in a negative way and start talking to yourself in a biblical way, in a biblical way. In fact, we find this in Psalms 42 and verse 5. Here's what David said. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you cast down? And why are you disquieted within me? And we'll, we'll touch base on that word disquieted because it's not a normal word we use. But here's what he says. He says, hope in God. For I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. So, so David stopped talking to himself in a negative way. And then we find him talking to himself and reminding him, hey, hope in God. He's talking to himself. Hope in God. Trust God. Hope in him. Here's the question that he asked. Why are you, why are you cast down? Cat, to, to be cast down means to be, means to be pressed down or to be depressed. And so David is saying, why are you depressed? Why are you pressed down, cast down? And then he uses the word disquieted. And, and the Hebrew word disquieted is growling. In other words, grumbling. Why are you grumbling? Why are you depressed? And why are you grumbling and growling and, and frustrated and, and angry and depressed and fearful? Why, 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 are you, why are you just talking to yourself in a way that's just working up fear in your life? Stop talking and start talking. Start talking. Put your hope in God. Stop, stop talking. I'm never going to make it. Start talking, with God all things are possible. Stop saying that you're going to die. Start saying, I'm going to live and declare the works of the Lord. Stop saying that all everything is falling apart and there's no hope and there's no future. Start saying, for I know that my God has a plan for me. Plans to prosper me and not to harm me. Plans of a hope and a future in my life. Stop talking and start talking God's word and speaking God's word over your life. Listen to me, listen to me. God is active in every part of our lives. He is. Jesus, the one who wins victory after victory, is active in every part of our lives, including our failures, our disappointments, our setbacks, our betrayals, our misunderstandings, our shattered dreams, our marriages, our singleness, our anger and anxiety. We live in a God-soaked world. But because of the earthquakes and the winds and the storms, the noise around us, we can't see him or hear him. And so here's the thing. Get still enough and quiet enough to see Jesus, hear Jesus, and experience Jesus in your life. 
So here's the last point, the third one, and it's this. It's get with God. Get with God. So what do I do in this moment? Like David, isolated. Like Elijah, quarantined, isolated in, in a cave. What do I do when I feel depressed, when I feel fear, when I feel like there's no hope? Stop talking to yourself. Start talking to yourself biblically and then get with God. Let's look again at verse 5, Psalms 42. David says, why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. Now, here's what I want you to know about that verse, that scripture. It's actually repeated three times in chapter 42 and in chapter 43. Three times, if you read those two chapters, you will reread that same scripture all with the exception of just one little word that I want us to catch because this is important. The scripture is actually three times, same exact verse, but one word is different. Here's the other place you can find that scripture, in verse 11 of Psalms 42. Let me read it. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? This is Psalms 43, 5, in chapter 43. Same verse, one little word has changed. Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance. Now, here's the difference. In Psalms 42, 11, where it says the help, excuse me, Psalms 42, 5, it says the help of his countenance. But in Psalms 42, 11 and 43, 5, it says the help of my countenance. In other words, when David began this journey, he was talking about the countenance of God. The countenance is the face. It's, it's what you look at. It's what you see. The hope of his countenance. And then it goes from there to the hope of my countenance. Let, let me break that down and just simplify very quickly here for you. Here's what he's saying. Here's what God's saying. What, here's what God's saying. When I look in his face, it changes my face. When I look at his face, at God's face, it changes my my face. When I look at God instead of my circumstances, I get encouraged instead of discouraged. When I push into God, God pushes into me. When I draw near to God, God draws near to me. And so that's what David is saying. So get with God. Begin to become a person to get still and be get, get quiet enough in the midst of whatever you're going through to get with God and to look on his countenance until his countenance becomes my countenance. Until the, until the, the faith and, and, and the courage and, and, and the sense of security that you see in the face of God becomes the face that you wear. Listen, the face, here's the thing with, with our faces. Some of us, your face is a dead giveaway of what you're feeling and what you're going through. You ever walk and meet someone or see someone and they didn't say anything, they didn't tell you anything, but you just look at their face and you ask them, what's wrong? What's going on? That's what our countenance does. That's what our face does. And can I tell you that when you look at the face of God today, there is no worry, there is no anxiety, there is no sense of hopelessness. And as we spend time, as we spend time switching what we stare at, what we look at. In other words, instead of the news of our choice, instead of the social media platform of our choice that we're constantly scrolling, that our face is constantly looking at, instead of the favorite TV show of your liking, what if we began to take moments of just quietness and silence and turn to God and get with Him? The reason I can smile even in moments of difficulty is because I serve a God that when I look at his face, he's smiling. The, the reason I can go through storms, and even though when, when I become afraid, even in moments where I get depressed or I'm cast down or I, I lose hope, 
I've got to remind myself, stop talking to yourself, Juan. And then I've got to remind myself, start talking to yourself what God is saying. And then I've got to look into his face. I've got to look into his face. And so that, so that when you see my face, if you think to yourself, well, man, that, that young man's got it all together, I really don't. <laughs> I really don't. But you know who does? Jesus does. He's got it all together. He's got it all together. Jesus wins. Jesus is okay. I may not be okay, but Jesus is. I, I may not have it all together, but Jesus does. Jesus is hopeful. Jesus is encouraged. Jesus has hope. Jesus has a plan. And so I want to get with him. Why? Because I want to get on the winning team. I want to get on the side of the one who's overcome, who's defeated death, hell, and the grave. The one who's given, who wants to give me victory. The problem is, is that we see it as delayed. It's hard to see. It's hard to hear. It's like what we're experiencing in this moment right now. What we're experiencing right now. See, the words that are coming out of my mouth, what you're seeing and what you're hearing, you may not know this, but it's delayed by about 30 seconds. About 30 seconds from now, you're going to hear and see the words that are coming out of my mouth. And really, it's like that with God. And see, we, we get depressed, we get down because we're not hearing victory. We're not seeing God. We're not seeing Jesus. The truth is, it's just because it's delayed. In fact, he's already said it. He's already done it. And what I'm saying is, hold on. Turn to him. Look, get with him so that the delay becomes smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. See, we've got maybe five people in this auditorium that sits 700. Because of proximity, they're hearing it now. They're hearing victory now. There's no delay. There's no sense of anxiety because they're waiting for something. No, they're hearing it now. You've got a delay because of separation, because of distance. But what I'm saying is get with God. Get with God, and maybe you're watching me right now. And you want to know, how, how do I? Jesus wins, but what about me? Listen, get with Jesus. If you're far from God, Stop being far from God. How do I get close? Listen, you'll get as close to God as you want to be. And so right now, right where you're watching from, begin to pray a prayer like this. Say, Jesus, come near me. Holy Spirit, join me. Father, come near to me. And, and the reason I'm saying it that way is it's because I know that it's hard for us to come near to him, to join him. And so God will honor a prayer that will say, I invite you, Jesus. I welcome you into my life, into my heart. I believe that you died for me, rose again. Believe with my heart. I confess with my mouth that you, Jesus, are Lord. And you're the only answer, the only hope for the brokenness, for the separation for the sin, the shame, the guilt. I give you my life today, Jesus. Give me your life in return. I want to be born again. Friend, right where you're watching from, you pray a prayer like that, where you open up your heart using your own words and saying, Jesus, I need you. Jesus will do a miracle in your life. And I'm telling you, friend, that no matter what you face in life, you're living in a moment that's soaked by God, we've got to shut off all the other voices and tune into the only voice that matters, the voice of God speaking into your heart, speaking into your life and into your family. We love you, and we believe that God is doing something significant in your life. Victory, friends and family, we're believing God for great things. I know it sounds odd. But even in the midst of all that we've gone through, we serve a Jesus that wins. And we are a part of his family. We are a part of his church. And I'm telling you that I, as, as dark as the darkness gets, we serve a God who's light in the midst of darkness. He gives us victory in the midst of whatever low valley we face in life. We serve a God who is resurrection power in the midst of death. 
We serve a God who's healer when you're sick. He's provider when you're down to nothing. We serve a God who holds the future and he holds the past and he holds this moment. He holds it all together. He's the author. He's the finisher of this whole story and I can trust him. He's got a track record of winning and we can trust him. So right where you're at, we want you to know we love you. We're praying for you. And we wish you an incredible Sunday today. And we can't wait to get back together soon. We love you. Have an incredible Mother's Day, Mom. And we'll see you soon.